This is Zoe Alexander with People's Dispatch. At the time of recording this, Israel is in the midst of launching perhaps the most severe bombardment on Gaza since October 7th and just cut all landline, cellular, and internet communications across the Gaza Strip. International aid organizations and media outlets have reported that they have completely lost contact with colleagues on the ground, with only satellite communications functioning at the moment. Many are warning that this could be the most serious and deadly attack on Palestinians in recent history. These actions have been met with sharp condemnation from people across the world, with almost daily protests and mobilizations occurring in towns and cities across the world over the last several weeks. Despite this global outcry, political leaders from North America and the EU have stood firm in expressing full support to Israel and thwarting genuine attempts at stopping the violence and calling for a ceasefire. However, this is not without exception. The progressive Irish party Sinn Féin and its members and leaders have stood out from other parties and politicians in the European Union in their support of the Palestinian struggle, their strong condemnation of Israel's attacks on Palestine, and the participation of even leaders from the party in street actions and solidarity with Palestine. And for this discussion, uh, we're very lucky to be joined by uh, Chris Hazard, who's an MP for South Down and a member of the Sinn Féin party. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Zoe. Great to be here. Great. So let's get right into it. Um, as we're speaking, we know that developments are happening on the ground in Gaza, um, the biggest of them being the fact that communications were just cut. And a it is rumored and it is being confirmed, as, again, as we're recording, that a land invasion uh, is in the process of taking place. Um, what are your thoughts on this escalation and how did we get here? Um, well, I think we've all been fair in this moment over the last couple of weeks um, that the bombardment was only the beginning of this wretched chapter uh, and the collapse and, you know, moral attitudes to all of this. You know, you see in recent days and weeks, Israel has targeted the basic civilian infrastructure of Gaza, the hospitals, the schools, the mosques, the churches, the food and supply lines. Now this evening, they've cut and targeted the communication systems, a complete blackout, and then commenced what has been described as the most intense bombardment yet. I've seen some local observers have described it as a belt of fire has enveloped uh, the Gaza Strip. I also seen that um, Israeli officials were talking again of warnings about the Al Shifa hospital. So you have to fear that you know that will be another hospital uh, in the crosshairs again this evening. So just another again chapter of the most egregious war crimes. Um, you know, I've said in recent days that. Certainly for those of us of our generation, you know, these are the most egregious war crimes, certainly in our living memory, if not longer. We're witnessing ethnic cleansing and genocide every day on our TV screens. And I think I think there's a growing anger with the complicity and the collusion of the Western powers in all of this, and that Gaza has been left to its own devices to face what is, you know, ultimately human and environmental annihilation. Yeah, definitely. I think that's exactly right. And um, you know, Sinn Féin has been one of the few parties uh, in the global north and in Europe um, that has actually taken what some would say is a principled stance on the situation, uh, condemning uh, the aggression from Israel, condemning the attacks on Palestinians. Um, what has been the response from other uh, EU countries, some other EU parties on the position of Sinn Féin? Um, what is, as they say, the political cost of standing with Palestine? And why, in the midst of all this, do you think the EU has has really locked down on its stance uh, in supporting Israel and condemning uh, everything uh, that Palestinians have done in this past couple of weeks? Well, you're right. And we, we led the, the calls in the Irish parliament, the Dáil, um, for a ceasefire. The Dáil was one of the first parliaments in the world, actually, to unanimously call for a ceasefire. That's the Irish parliament in, in Dublin. Um, there's no real surprise in this, actually. In 2021, the Dáil was also the first um, parliament. Ireland became the first EU state to unanimously condemn Israel's de facto annexation of Palestinian land. So there is unanimous agreement right across the political spectrum in Ireland that there must be a ceasefire, that Israel must be held to account. 
and that the Western powers have to intervene um, to ensure that that ceasefire happens. Um, again, this is built upon uh, a shared legacy of colonialism. That sense of solidarity runs very deep. And it means the wider Irish population, the Irish nation and our diaspora understands that the route to peace in Palestine is built on the need for Israel to end the occupation and apartheid that's been imposed on Palestinians. So in recent weeks, for example, not only has our parliament demanded a ceasefire with one voice, but the Irish Taoiseach, the, the Irish Prime Minister and the Irish President have both also criticised the EU Commission President, Ursula von der Leyen, making it clear that she does not speak for Ireland. You know, you, you'll remember, your viewers will remember, she was heavily criticised for her stance in visiting Israel at a time when they were committing these war crimes. And our president, Michael D. Higgins, put it very well that she had reduced international law to tatters. So in response to that, the Irish government have increased humanitarian aid to Palestine. So we've almost doubled it now, 13 million euros on top of the annual 10 million euros that goes to Palestine. So we've had every town and village has seen street demonstrations, much like we're seeing around uh, the rest of the world. People are coming out um, and there's been a long standing sense of solidarity, you know, not just in official Ireland and with the political parties, but more, more generally, you know, we have significant, you know, organized solidarity organizations such as the Irish Palestine Solidarity Campaign that for many years has been to the fore in organizing support and fundraising events for Palestine. We also have Irish human rights organizations based in Palestine. And as I say, much of that goes back to a long-standing, shared experience of colonialism. But in a more recent context, you know, from the 1960s, there was a very strong anti-colonial solidarity between Ireland, South Africa and Palestine. Um, you know, the Irish Parliament was one of the first parliaments in the world again to recognise the PLO um, as the legitimate voice of the Palestinians. So... Uh, certainly for ourselves as a political party, not just because we are the the main vehicle for Irish reunification coming out of an anti-colonial struggle, but our friends and neighbours and brothers and sisters outside of our own party and across the wider um, Irish society are very, very proud to stand with Palestine and are actually proud of our political leaders for this these last few weeks, standing up with the one voice to demand a ceasefire and to demand peace for Palestine. Yeah, and I think the the Irish people are joined by millions across the globe who have been on the streets um, with these demands, uh, calling for an end to the violence against the Palestinian people. Um, for you, you've been active in the Palestinian solidarity movement, the international solidarity movement for a while. Um, what do you see is different about this moment? Would you say there's an increase in support? Um, what does this say to you? Are you hopeful about this moment? Yeah, I, I think there actually is. You know, I've I seen somebody commenting um, recently that, you know, all has changed. And there certainly feels to be um, a rising anger, not just in the global south, but I think right across. You know, you'll have seen yourself the scenes in places like Texas and New York and Washington. Um, there's a real sense of anger. And I think much of that comes from an anger with political leaders who are complicit in all of this refusing to stand up for peace and to call for a ceasefire. You know, when people see the barbaric scenes coming from Gaza, they, they rightfully are angered and, and they want political leaders to stand up for peace. And I think there's been a real sense of frustration that, you know, why, why have political leaders, you know, why has the EU failed? You know, why has Britain and the American administrations, why have they failed to stand up for peace in this? And I think it throws back you know, more recent memories, obviously, of the devastation caused in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, you know, the sense of the movement in America now that is growing, it's reminiscent. I, you know, neither of us were around in those days, but it seems to be reminiscent of the anti-Vietnam War um, feeling that was growing across the American nation. And I think there's a sense that we're at a tipping point now for Palestine. You know, I've noticed local businesses, even look some uh, local uh, doctors and um, practitioners you know, with a poster in a window for Palestine, you know, that didn't happen in recent times, but it's happening now. I think the real sense of desperation 
is seeping through our televisions each night. Social media has brought it much more vividly into all of our homes as well. And I think people are genuinely shocked at the extent to which Israel has been enabled to be able to commit, as I say, some of the most egregious war crimes in our time. Yeah, definitely. And I think uh, in coming days, this is going to be you know, continuing to unfold, especially about what's happening uh, right now. But I guess as a final comment, uh, how do you see this struggle moving forward for Palestine? Is this going to spread into larger struggles against imperialism? What do you see as the way forward in the next couple of weeks? Yeah, well, first and foremost, I, I suppose, there's, I think there is a sense of trepidation and fear. I, I sense people are terrified tonight looking at social media, the comments already that, you know, haven't bombarded Gaza from the skies for, for many days now. Um that the armed forces will begin in on the ground in the, in the darkness of night. Um, communications have been cut. Um, so the, the, the war crimes are going to increase exponentially. The suffering and the, the pain and the heartache, um, you know, in the dead of night, I, I, I think we're going to be in for some very gruesome scenes. Uh, it's not also going to be straightforward, I don't think, for the Israeli forces. I think they're going to be um, dragged down now into the mire uh, in Gaza, God only knows where we go for this. I, I think we have to hope um, that the Western political establishments waken um, to the crimes being committed and understand and put pressure on Israel now to cease. Um, because any any notion that Israel is somehow defending itself, you know, has been completely um, eviscerated by their actions in recent days. I have no doubt that will be tenfold whenever we see that when we finally see the scenes from Gaza over the next few days. So we have to hope for negotiated peace out of all of this. But the big fear, of course, is that they've went far too far, um, that the region itself is now going to be enveloped uh, in a conflict. You know, you see the um, the warships beginning to move into the eastern Mediterranean. Um, and, and, and that's the big fear in all of this, that this spills over not just to Lebanon and Syria, but then the other regional powers become involved in all of this. And, you know, where that ends up then um, is horrifying to even think about. Definitely. I think we're definitely in, in trying times that are very uh, difficult to predict, difficult to say what will follow. Um, but I thank you so much for your time and we'll be continuing to follow the developments, especially uh, how the EU powers will respond, how officials in the US are going to respond to this and how the people on the streets who have been standing with, uh, with Palestine for these weeks, um, how that's going to continue to develop. Absolutely. And I think there's a, there is now a new generation that's willing to stand up for Palestine. And, you know, no doubt that's going to be vitally important in the time ahead. Thank you.